So uh, a very good afternoon again and a very warm welcome to the webinar on uh, how to make complaint response mechanism participatory and responsive. I am Zainab Raza and I'm working with Community World Service Asia as the Deputy Director for Governance. Thank you very much to all of you for registering and joining this event, which many of you might know is part of the 2020 Regional Humanitarian Partnership events that are organized as a collaborative initiative by Asian Disaster Reduction and Response Network, which is the ADRRN. International Council of Voluntary Agencies, ICWA, UN Office for Humanitarian Affairs, which is OCHA, and Community World Service Asia. Uh, many of you would already know, but it would be nice to again uh, give a background that CWS Asia hosts the ADRRN's Quality and Accountability Hub for Asia, where we focus to strengthen principled humanitarian action in the region through promoting Q&A standards, approaches, and principles among ADRRN members. We are also the Sphere Focal Point and the regional partner of Sphere in Asia. And to strengthen and extend the reach of our commitments on promoting Q&A, we are also a member of the core humanitarian standard, that is the CHS Alliance. CWS Asia is a very active in promoting CHS, Sphere, and the companion standards in Pakistan, as well as in the region. This uh, includes, beside many other uh, activities, trainings of NGOs and civil society organizations, promoting memberships, encouraging partner organizations for CHS, self-assessment, and sharing information about these standards and relevant tools. As a part of uh, our commitment to promote accountability to affected population in the region, we strive to engage the humanitarian and development professionals in our quality and accountability capacity program. This includes engagement at different level, for example, with individuals, organizations, networks, government departments, and the academia. As an organization, uh, we believe the most important aspect of humanitarian and development interventions is that the assistance is truly accountable to the people that we aim to support. So uh, this commitment internally is demonstrated through our accountability framework and by mainstreaming quality and accountability in the organization across the board. Our strategy is to ensure shifts in mindsets, leading to an increased capacity to self-monitor the levels of QA compliance. These interventions are more people-centered, ensuring participatory approaches, community ownership of uh, interventions, and their inclusion in decision-making processes. Individuals are treated with dignity, besides providing them rights to voice their complaints. To strengthen the CRM across the board, our journey is based on uh, 12 key steps in establishing and running an effective complaint response mechanism. As we proceed uh, through the webinar, at some point, uh, I would request Khurram to kindly share that PDF file about the 12 key steps in the chat box, just for information and reference uh, of others. Today's event, as you know, is about how to make complaint response mechanism participatory and responsive to ensure aid effectiveness and better community participation in CRM. The concept involves the integration of organizational values and commitment for accountability to effective population to its program and policies. We are very hopeful that this webinar will build upon key components of establishing CRM, taking into account increased challenges such as the reasons for the lack of reports, how to establish trust within communities through improved communication and identifying the ways of ensuring better dialogue. We will try our best 
and of course the our respected uh, facilitator and the panelist will uh, engage in trying to explore the possible gaps and needs in ensuring an effective participatory and responsive complaint response mechanism that was uh, basically an insight and a background and uh, now before i hand over the webinar uh, to the webinar facilitator some of the basic housekeeping rules are displayed here uh, for everyone's information mainly including uh, the time the duration which is 90 minutes around 90 minutes for the webinar the video feature is turned off by default so that there are no interceptions and all attendees will be muted to avoid background noise uh, you are uh, encouraged please to submit your questions via the q a feature or you may also upload each other's questions the you please use the cha chat feature to communicate with us and each other during the webinar and uh, we will also use the polling feature to have your opinion. Last but not the least, this webinar will be recorded. And uh, like the previous uh, webinars, the recording will be uploaded on our website. You will all be receiving a link to access that later. Now, without really taking more of your time, I'll just quickly uh, introduce our respected facilitator, Ms. Esther Dross. Ms. Dross is an independent consultant with over 25 years of experience, specializing in accountability, prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, gender and child protection. Ms. Dross has uh, an extensive exposure to humanitarian certification systems and accountability to affected population while working with HAP International as their complaints handling and investigation advisor, later as their certification manager, she has been closely involved in building safer organizations uh, projects since 2005, dealing with sexual exploitation and abuse of beneficiaries, particularly focusing on gender and child protection. Over the last six years, and since working as an independent consultant, Esther has been leading a pilot project for FAO on accountability and gender mainstreaming in emergencies and working with numerous NGOs, including Act Alliance members, supporting and training their staff on gender issues, child protection, accountability, complaints handling, and investigations. She is an experienced investigator herself and has conducted investigations in Asia, South America, Africa, and Europe. I'm sure uh, you will hear a lot more from Esther uh, about her work and uh, of course, focusing on the theme of the webinar today. With that, I would thank you all once again for participating and would request Esther now to kindly take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Zainab. And welcome to all of you. I can see there is a lot of people on the on the call. So welcome to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Can we maybe proceed to the next slide, uh, Huram, and we'll start right away with what we really are here for. So why do we actually want to deal with complaints? which seems to be a very difficult topic. We've all met in the past, most of, of, of us have met on conferences, webinars to discuss how we can establish more effective complaints handling systems. So this, this subject is really not something new. You know that we've run a seminar already in May with CWSA on complaints handling, and we've covered some basic aspects <clears throat> related to how we should establish uh, the systems and what are the challenges related to this. However, despite this, this long work on, on setting up complaint systems, the Humanitarian Accountability Report from 2020 from the CHS Alliance has again underlined the fact that uh, efficient complaints handling remains a major gap with, uh, with many humanitarian organizations. It's actually usually the commitment which has the lowest scoring 
of um, within their, their uh, assessment system. This is worrying because complaints handling, efficient complaints handling is the key, how we can close uh, accountability. And Zainab has very rightly started by saying how important quality and accountability is to make a humanitarian aid more efficient and effective. Maybe I should actually put my video on so that you can also see me. Good, let's continue. Can you put the next slide on? Please, thank you. Just again, uh, we've had some interesting headlines, uh, at least here in, in Europe. I don't know if that has reached uh, to, to Asia, but this lack in efficient reporting systems and lack of how we address it within the sector, widespread sexual violence, has again been reported by the new humanitarian a couple of months ago in its latest article on the Ebola response including allegations of over 50 women who allegedly had been exploited by humanitarian workers to exchange sex for food. And so what is really striking is that most of them said that they did not trust or they did not know how to complain. Although most of the involved organizations had actually complaint systems. So it looks like we're still missing something when we set up these systems so that uh, many of the issues which are uncovered are rather uncovered by journalists than through our own internal system, uh, either directly by survivors or by whistleblowers. So what are we missing? It's actually my question to you, uh, if we can just quickly use the, the chat function and maybe go to the next slide. Just give yourself 30 seconds to think through why do people, why are people hesitant, either whistleblowers or survivors, to complain even when we do have a system, which is the case of many, many of our organizations. You can use the chat function just to share this with us. What, what is your take on that? problem or question. Any feedback from those 150 participants we have online? What are major barriers, even though we have the system? Nobody? No ideas? Okay. Trust. Not knowing. Lack of trust. Fear. Confidentiality. Okay, now they all come in. Safety, fear, reprisal. Shame, stigma lack of knowledge, lack of information, consequences, <clears throat> no incentive. Excellent. Just ask the women, simplicity. Yes, thank you very much to whoever has just said this, simplicity. Just ask the women and just ask the um, communities. Thank you, that was Uwe. Thank you very much. Cultural stereotypes. So I can see a lot of confidentiality, a lot of lack of trust, and a lot of a lot of fear. Thanks a lot <clears throat> for this. Um, maybe we can move on to the next one, uh, Huron. So clearly, when we look at the number of complaints we receive, we deal with, which are reported, and when we compare them, I don't have the figures from our poll just before, but I know that most of the organizations do have systems to receive complaints. And most of the organizations I know and work with have systems to receive complaints. So when we compare uh, the number of complaints we're actually dealing with, with the probably overall beneficiary numbers worldwide, and also given that we work in very high, high risk areas in volatile situations and with very vulnerable population, it is quite obvious that the complaints we're receiving 
are not sufficient uh, for the many reasons you've just, you've just said, no trust, no, um, pretty no trust in confidentiality. Systems are sometimes too simple. Uh, it struck me in the recent uh, Ebola case that uh, an organization reported that they had 22 channels to receive complaints. Nevertheless, they did not receive one complaint on the issue. So uh, simplicity might be one of the of the major barriers, or the rather the other way around. The complexity of some of the systems might not be helpful for people to um, to inform us about concerns and incidents. So let us move back a little bit to uh, the subject of accountability. When we, um, you can move forward, Huram. When we talk about accountability, clearly we talk about a number of commitments and these commitments we've commonly agreed upon. Um, they're all interlinked, as we all know. So this is around doing no harm. It's about resources. It's about relevance, effectiveness, participation, information. And of course, this is about complaints. And the, the key commitment in that circle or the commitment which will help us to ensure that we fulfill all the other commitments is clearly this, this efficient and effective robust complaint system. If we do not have complaints, if you do not have an easy system to receive these complaints, how do we even know that we fulfill all the other commitments we have been commit, committing ourselves to? How do we know if our information is appropriate, if the participation, um, is meaningful to the communities we work with, if our staff is well-trained, well-supported, and if our programs overall are efficient and timely. So this gap um, in, 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 uh, in having efficient complaints systems is actually not helpful to demonstrate that we are fully accountable to the beneficiaries and to, to the communities we work with. You all know that accountability, the simplest way to define accountability, you, you can move forward. The simplest way to define accountability is how we use power in a responsible way. This is also about how we share power responsibly with our stakeholders, who in many cases, um, most of them have by definition less power than, than we as humanitarian workers. Power is linked to a variety of issues. I'm just uh, wanting to underline some of them. So clearly linked to economical and social status. Uh, for example, in the example I've talked about before on the DRC example, it was clearly linked to the economical situation, poverty. The women needed an income, they needed a job, and they were fearful of losing their job or not getting a job if they did not agree to sexual relationship with humanitarian stuff. It's also, of course, linked to individual vulnerabilities, poverty, job security, health, illness, any um, different um, handicaps, but also gender, age, ethnicity, education. Uh, if we're illiterate, literate or not, is extremely important to how we can access the power. So accountability is not about uh, denying that there are power differentials, but it's clearly about how we can share this power responsibly um, so that we have some more um, balance in this power situation. Can you please move? I've just been saying a lot of, a lot of, um, reasons why power is uh, different from one to the other, but one of the uh, key issues is actually about knowledge and information. And this is a very simple factor to, to influence. We cannot necessarily always influence very quickly on situations like being a refugee or being uh, jobless or being poor, but we can definitely uh, be uh, much better in how we share information, how we share knowledge, and by this, we do share um, power. Uh, knowledge is power. And of course, we can, we should share information on a variety of issues. If we move on, it struck me while I was thinking about these 
the, this topic. Um, and because I'm, <laughs> I'm working in this field for, for many years, I still remember those two studies from 2008, so that's over 10 years ago, um, called No One to Turn To, and, and the second one, To Complain or Not To Complain, this is still the questions. So it struck me that a lot of these uh, things which are written in these two reports remain unfortunately valid still today because of this lack of efficient, transparent, uh, confidential systems. Survivors continue to wonder if they should complain or not, if it is safe, if there will be retaliation, if there will be stigma, if they will be supported or if they will be blamed for being a survivor through the process of raising the complaint. And the whistleblowers and, and survivors are still very often unsure to whom they should turn to, to report an incident, whom they can trust, uh, how works the system, how complex is the system, where they should call, how they will call, how they will reach out to us. So um, I'll be happy to share these two studies with you if you want to go back and dig into the history, but still very, um, a lot of uh, very useful recommendations in these two very old studies. Uh, Esther, sorry for interrupting, but I think some people can't hear you. Could you kindly speak a bit louder? Okay, good. I'll try to speak louder. Thank you, Zainab. Uh, thank you. Can we move on, please? There is also a more recent study, again, talking about this power imbalance. So this is a report from Yaran in Paris from 2018, which is called From Voices to Choices. So this is really about when we give voices, when we do allow meaningful participation, and this goes up to how we establish our complaint system. We actually allow people to have a choice not only have a voice, but have a choice. So this report underlines the importance of community participation in decision-making and shaping our projects, shaping our programs. But this is also about shaping our procedures. And it's only when participation really means giving a voice to communities, which results for them to have choices that we can speak about accountability and the change of organizational culture. And this is what we need to to do if we want to have more efficient, effective complaint systems? How do we welcome complaints more positively in a more proactive way? Uh, and giving this voice and offering choices is about sharing knowledge and it's about sharing power. Give back the power to the communities and ask them what is the best way to complain and what are their problems in the, in the in the topic of um, complaining. So we need to improve on knowledge we are sharing and how we do this um, knowledge sharing. And I think Janet will give us a very concrete example a bit later on Afghanistan. So sharing information is about sharing about our project. It's sharing about selection criteria. It's about duration, but it's also about staff responsibilities. Uh, what obligations our staff has, what are their core commitments, what are the rules, behavioral rules, and how we encourage and receive, but also how we handle complaints. So what is the consequence if I come to you and submit a complaint? What is reported by many survivors of, for example, sexual misconduct is that the pure fact of knowing what are your rights, what is actually the meaning of, for example, sexual exploitation or sexual abuse, but also how you will be supported when you're reporting a safeguarding concern is contributing to higher reporting because it makes the survivor feel safer. So we simply need to communicate, to think much more how we do um, communicate about behavioral issues, how we make people understand what we mean by the policies and how they can feel safe when they get to us. I want to uh, show you an example, uh, I'll show you a small video now. This is an example how we can communicate around our behavioral expectations and what we mean by what is written in our code of conduct. It's a very short video, five minutes. So if you can uh, play the video, uh, Huram, please.
Khurram, uh, there is no sound, I think. Yes. John and Fat. Sorry, sorry for Meet this. John and Fatima. They are aid workers like you, who have just started working for a humanitarian organization. Everyone who works with a humanitarian organization is an aid worker, even volunteers, short-term staff, and contractors. The most important part of their job is to make sure they do no harm to the communities they serve. The people in this community have been affected by disaster or conflict. Some people, like women, children, and people living with disabilities, may be more at risk of experiencing abuse or harm than others. John and Fatima must treat everyone in the community with respect. Aid workers must not take advantage of the communities they support. If they do, they will harm individuals. They may destroy the relationship with the community and they may lose their jobs. So what are some things John and Fatima should be aware of? Aid workers like John and Fatima are in positions of power. As a program officer from a different part of the country, John holds power because of his age, wealth, expertise, position, and gender. As a community mobilizer from the local community, Fatima also has power. The community sees her leading activities, working closely with other aid workers, and sharing information about resources and services. Whether true or not, community members believe that aid workers control access to resources and services. In contrast, community members often have little control over access to those things. Because of this, People may feel they cannot say no to anything John and Fatima ask of them. They might be afraid that if they say no, they or their families will not receive aid. John and Fatima must consider the power that people think they have. They must never abuse their power. Aid workers can abuse their power in many ways. One of the most harmful ways is through sexual exploitation and abuse. Sexual exploitation is when a person convinces someone with less power to participate in sexual activities. For example, if an aid worker offers extra rations or money in exchange for sex, that can be sex even without physical contact. For example, online or by text message. Sexual abuse happens when a person forces someone with less power to participate in sexual activities against their will. For example, if an aid worker forces someone to kiss them or participate in sexual activities with them. To help guide aid workers like you, John and Fatima and keep vulnerable communities safe, there are a few important principles that all aid workers must follow. Aid workers must always treat the community with respect, both during and outside working hours. Sexual exploitation and abuse threatens the dignity of people that aid workers are supposed to assist and protect. Aid workers are not allowed to have sexual relationships with anyone under the age of 18, even if it is legal in the country. Not knowing the person's age is not a valid excuse. Aid workers are not allowed to pay for sex. They also cannot exchange employment, goods or services for sex, or even suggest it. Aid workers are not allowed to have sexual relations with anyone receiving assistance, even if that person is willing. If any of these principles are broken, humanitarian workers can be disciplined and even lose their job. In many countries, they may also face criminal prosecution. What happens if John or Fatima or anyone in the community sees or suspects any sexual exploitation or abuse by another aid worker? They must report any possible or actual exploitation or abuse they have seen or heard about. 
they should never investigate it themselves. It is someone else's job to find out what really happened. If aid workers like John and Fatima are scared to report, they can report it anonymously through their organization's sexual exploitation and abuse focal point or reporting mechanism. To keep that information confidential, they should not discuss it with anyone else. All aid organizations should have a clear and easy way for people to share their concerns. We want all people to be and feel safe and protected from harm. Sexual exploitation and abuse takes advantage of vulnerable people. All of us must prevent sexual exploitation and abuse. Everything that John and Fatima have learned in this video applies to you in your role too. If you have any questions about this training, please contact the Sexual Exploitation and Abuse or Safeguarding Focal Person in your organization. Or you can speak to your manager, protection, gender-based violence, or other technical lead. For more information, visit www.interaction.org. Thank you, thank you very much for this. Um, so this is just an example of how we can communicate around commitments in regards, with regards to sexual exploitation and abuse, what we mean um, by the different uh, issues of what we mean by power, what we mean by respect. Um, it's, a, it's a video which you can download for uh, free on the website of Interaction. And uh, I actually think it's a really nice example, which also explains that power is not just what we really have or what we really use, but it's also a question of perception, what other people think. Uh, people very often think we might have even more power than we have, and that can lead very easily to situations where we abuse the power we're, we're having. So thank you for the video and uh, let's move on. So um, as we see in the media, this is really about communicating more extensively about duties and rights of um, the people we work with and for, but also of ourselves. What are our duties? What are our commitments? What is behavioral issues? And what is prohibited behavior? So clearly um, to to tell us that we don't follow our commitments. People need to know, know what are our commitments and know what we mean by, for example, safeguarding. What we mean by sexual expectation is not that easy to sometimes understand what we, the words we use in our policies. So uh, sharing knowledge on core commitments is not just about publishing our policies, it's about explaining what we mean by these words. And it's about being very clear on, on a number of key issues, like I've put them here, to say that there is no sexual activity with children and explain what is a child, because the understanding of a child is not the same everywhere in the world. Explain very clearly that there is no exchange of money, employment, humanitarian aid or medical consultation or whatever else for sex. And that uh, sexual relationship between humanitarian workers and beneficiaries are um, uh, strongly and in some uh, for some organizations completely prohibited but sharing information is also sharing very clear communication and information about to people that it is actually a right to complain so um, uh, that it's clear that you can come forward with any any thing you would like to submit to the organization, it's your right and the organization has an obligation to respond. And maybe it's also good to remind our own staff that they have an obligation to report if they have any concerns about uh, misconduct happening and they have an obligation to create a safe environment. And this is also something we can communicate to communities because this is something we should work together. We can move forward, please. When we talk about having complaint systems, a question which comes 
all the time up and which I'm asked many, many times is if you have a complaint system and you start telling people what we can do and what we cannot do and that we're not entitled, that we have no right to abuse our power or we have no right to um, uh, have personal relationship with beneficiaries or anything else, how do we avoid receiving malicious complaints? Question comes up very often. How do we know that somebody is not lying when reporting an incident, is not taking an action against a staff member because of some personal history of revenge or some other reason? So I want to address this question before somebody of you is asking uh, <laughs> this question. It's very often used as a deterrent for setting up systems uh, and distracts us actually from the, the, the key reason why we want to have these systems. So what do we know on malicious complaints? First, we know that of course we do receive com malicious complaints very clearly. It happens, I won't tell you that it never happens. But we also know, and you have uh, given many of these barriers, we know that there are so many barriers to raise a complaint and even more so to raise a complaint on any kind of sexual misconduct because it's something very intimate, very personal. It's not easy to go come forward and talk about having been sexually exploited or abused. So because we know that it's difficult, we also know that people have to overcome these barriers to come and talk to us. It is not that frequent that people come and have a malicious complaint on sexual misconduct. Obviously, to be sure, we have to investigate the complaint when it comes up. And in case of a malicious complaint, it is usually pretty clear quite quickly in this investigation process that the complaint is malicious. And if that happens, it is, of course, very important that the organization has a procedure how they will address if they receive a malicious complaint. What is the disciplinary action taken against a staff member who has submitted a malicious complaint? Because if we do not take any action, then of course, um, we send a signal that you can actually use the complaint system to, um, to bring forward personal or malicious complaints. I also want to underline here that it is not because a complaint is not substantiated in an investigative process that by definition it is a malicious complaint. So it's very important to be very clear on these differences. A malicious complaint is one which is raised without any grounds and where the complainant knows that whatever he or she reports is untrue. An unsubstantive complaint is one which has been raised, for example, on sexual harassment or even sexual exploitation, and where we cannot find sufficient evidence to, re to support that complaint. It's very, diff uh, very uh, important to keep in mind that there is a huge difference between those two kinds of, um, of results from an investigation. And we can move to the next one, please. So, just a couple of ideas before we move to uh, to Jeanette. How can we communicate more efficiently on our complaint systems? Well, this is about communicating clearly our values, our mission, our ethics, our core commitments, but also our, our project plan activities. How we, uh, what are the criteria? How we select our beneficiaries? Who is our staff? And what are their responsibilities? And of course, uh, we need to do that in a simple and culturally appropriate way in consultation with communities. Um, uh, ask the women how we can communicate around sexual violence, sexual exploitation, sexual abuse, for example. But also ask people how they would save to feel to raise complaints, how, how they traditionally do that. What is their expectation in terms of procedures from our side? So how can we do this uh, better communication? Well, as we all know, use the distribution teams, um, uh, the distribution sites to have leaflets. We can print information, um, prohibitions, uh, behavioral rules on parcels. Uh, we can have information boards, but we can also have radio programs as that is seen in some countries to 
explain, for example, behavioral rules. We can have public speakers. We can use theater drama groups and of course have focus group discussions to, to make very clear what are these rules, how we implement them and how people can complain if, uh, if we do not uphold these um, behavioral rules. But of course, we also need, and you, we can move to the next one, we also need uh, to think around survivor centeredness and survive, survivor support. So to map what we have as support available and then communicate around the available support, because that is a, a word which often comes up from um, survivors is what support can we get? What about our safety and security? Uh, there might be health issues. There might be psychosocial issues. There is very often also legal issues, something we could call criminal accountability. We, of course, know that not all concerns linked to sexual exploitation and abuse are necessarily defined as a criminal activity by the national law but some of them, them are sexual assault, rape, sexual activity with a child, which is always considered as being a sexual abuse because the child cannot give consent, are actually criminal activities. So we need to know how we will follow up such complaints if they involve some illegal behavior in the country where it happens, or if it's illegal in the country from which the stuff comes. So we need to know, will we support survivors into these legal processes? Will we help them to connect and finance lawyers? Will we not? Is there any association where you work who can help survivors of sexual violence to raise complaints, not only to the organization, but also legally if they would like to? And many of the survivors of sexual violence actually report that they are convinced that there would be less sexual violence if perpetrators would be brought in front of national courts and not only in front of our own administrative um, complaint systems. So this is something important to consider and, and uh, reflect on. Again, to have a variety of channels to reach out to your organization is important, but these channels should be uh, checked with community members. They should have an input into telling us how they would like to complain. And again, simplicity is the key. Maybe to have 22 channels is not the best solution, rather have maybe less but more efficient channels and appropriate channels corresponding to what the communities have identified. What is also important is that we can demonstrate that when we receive sensitive complaints and remember that sensitive complaints is anything around sexual misconduct, but also corruption, fraud, we need to demonstrate that we can deal with these complaints outside the project area. So confidentially, independently, and that it will not uh, backlash on the complainant or the survivor um, in that particular region or project. And overall, uh, be inclusive, take the time to set up these systems, take the time to consult with communities and pre be proactive. Be proactive in raising complaints. It's been quite clear that, um, for example, in, in DRC, we, we have not been really proactive in looking for complaints. Uh, we very often have a system and we, happy that we have no complaints. But this is about really going out and tell people, check if there is any problem so that we can address the problem when it comes up. Good. Maybe the last one and then I will hand over to Jeanette. Thank you. So trust building is the key. And, and many of you have said that in the beginning that this lack of, lack of trust is one of the main barriers to complaining. So to build trust, we also need to report on received complaints. We need to report how many complaints we've received about what they were, um, how we dealt with them. 
without breaching, of course, confidentiality. We don't need, need to give details. This is about saying we received 150 complaints and half of them were uh, concerning sensitive issues and half of them have been substantiated. But if we do not report on how many complaints we're receiving or how we deal with them and how many of them are substantiated, we do not build the trust from the community to see that there's actually some action when they uh, send us a complaint. So the feedback on findings is important. Feeding back to the survivors, to the complainants um, and to the relevant um, stakeholders. Very good. Uh, I think I want to turn to Jeanette. Jeanette, if you're online, to um, talk to us more about a very practical example and Afghanistan. Thank you so much, Esther. Uh, my name is Janet, uh, interagency PSEA coordinator based in Afghanistan. And uh, I mean, I appreciate the, the detailed presentation from the Esther already give us an overview um, of what the session is all about and the importance of, um, you know, importance of reporting um, sexual exploitation and abuse related matters and, and how to refer them as well. So I'm just going to take you through, um, just a moment. Can you, can you see my screen, Esther? Yep. All right, yep. thank you. So um, for Afghanistan, I'm just going to focus on key strategic areas um, of concerns, basically um, speaking about the cultural sensitivity um, of discussing um, sexual exploitation and abuse and how they affect women um, in Afghanistan. And uh, what are some of the multiple uh, trusted way, two-way communication channel for making PSEA complaints and, and getting responses, you know, communication channels basically need to reflect on how people in different parts of, of the country um, say they prefer to give information or to receive information to and from the humanitarians. Um, uh, at the same time, um, we also need to, you know, they also need to be accountable um, for people um, living in hard to reach areas. Because I've seen a couple of questions people asking, how do we get to people who are in hard to reach areas, um, not accessible due to some reasons. And um, I think as we continue, uh, uh, probably this will come out very clear, probably sharing some kind of experiences on, on, on how that is done, right? And, um, um, and with the current COVID-19 situation, um, you know, globally um, for Afghanistan, um, you know, other channels are being used to actually address the COVID-19 um, 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 issues or matters and responses to and from um, the community. Um, establishing um, a high level government focal point for sexual exploitation and abuse allegations is, is also very key for us here in Afghanistan because I don't know what happened in other countries, but we felt like it's, it's necessary. And because uh, the exploiters, if I say so, are not just people from humanitarian workers, but there could be, you know, um, others as well. Um, I'm holding PSEA training for national um, NGOs and international NGO staff and engaging with donors to fund this specific training is, is also key for us. Um, and the last Last one basically is coordinating PSEA in country um, with the accountability to the affected population working group, which, which is, is a technical working group based in the country, um, with the risk communication working group, you know, that is currently actually supporting in terms of tracking rumors um, and COVID-19 rumors and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm working very closely with the GIHA, the Gender um, in Humanitarian Action Working Group, the protection cluster, as well as the subclusters and other um, relevant um, entities um, in the response. So um, how has the uh, PSEA struck uh, CFM? When I say CFM is a complaint feedback mechanism, I know in other locations they call it 
um, CRM, the Complaint Response Mechanism. So please allow me to use the CFM for today and we can always relate as, as we proceed with the session, right? So um, how has the PSCF CFM environment changed in Afghanistan? Um, so I just wanna give a couple of examples. There are so many other examples, but just to summarize, um, it's basically increased awareness. Um, for us, it's, it's important to mention that PSCA is a regular part of the ICCT, the intercluster technical um, group in the country as well as um, um, the operational dis, uh, discussions and, and strategic thinking in the HCT, um, uh, the humanitarian country team, right? Um, more agencies are involved in PSCA discussions and because we got a task force, um, a very active uh, task force team in the country and most agencies have also designated PSCA focal points um, to promote better handling of complaints. So this is just one way of, um, 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 I would say we've increased our awareness on PSCA as well as um, communication with community in terms of um, complaint and feedback mechanism. Um, um, enhanced capacity, um, efforts are underway to build uh, PSCA capacity in the field. Um, I don't want to say that we've done a lot, especially when it comes to um, um, passing the same message at the grassroots level, as well as uh, the field offices, but this is work on progress. Um, and the context is already challenging. There are a lot of concerns, a lot of safety security concerns, um, hard to reach areas um, due to reasons and so on. But I think it's, it's work on progress. And, and of course, this is in coordination with the different classes and different actors um, in the country. Um, capacity building um, work is important improving awareness and understanding of PSCA obligations and processes. Um, this is something that we also working on as, 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 as a team in the country, you know, with support from different um, actors who actually um, have expertise in, in this, um, uh, in this specific, um, um, specific topic um, of PSCA. Okay. Um, better guidance, so the standard operating procedures um, have been circulated to all the clusters, organizations, and other respons uh, responsible entities on how to handle um, PSCA allegations, um, training have been planned for different actors um, uh, on SOP. So for us, the, the standard operating procedures that we have is basically for processing and recording complaints in the country, um, with a very clear referral chart, um, as well as um, um, a tracking, um, tracking sheet that helps us, you know, um, understand the kind of cases and how to refer and basically to follow up on, on, uh, on some, of these, uh, some of these cases. Um, I must say that the, the SOP is actually embraced by different, uh, you know, entities in the country, um, including the head city um, that is fully supporting the, the PSCA work um, in Afghanistan. Um, the last one, more accountability. Um, I mean, which I think can also be a good lesson or something that I must mention is that um, the collaboration between the PSCA task force um, the accountability to the affected population technical working group in the country, you know, um, help ensure that people are better aware of their rights um, and, and of ways to report abuses. So this is key in any context, you know, and not just Afghanistan, but I think in other countries that we probably know that we've worked in, that this coordination is very key because sometimes approaching um, PSCA by itself makes it more complicated and rather bringing the efforts together, creating joint messages, clear um, and AAP PSCA related messages are very, are very key. And then um, as well as making good use of the recently um, published uh, partners capacity assessment tool, which I, I want to believe that most of the UN organizations are making good use of it to actually measure, you know, um, how partners are making good use of this tool, as well as ensure that the PSCA component is properly mainstreamed into our programming. Um, 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 I, I don't know if most of us have heard about it, but if it's something that you'd be interested to look into, 
I'm more than happy to touch base with colleagues and, and, um, and have a look at it. So um, the sensitivity of discussing sexual exploitation and abuse and how it affects women in Afghanistan. So to be very precise, I try to, 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 to discuss about the sensitive issues, but then ways to address those issues, like what we are trying to do um, with, the, with the support of other technical working groups, as well as the task force in the country is sensitivities of the issues of the culture of silence. You know, um, When I talk about the culture of silence, basically the norms, the attitudes, you know, as, as you mentioned, as most of colleagues mentioned in the chat box, you know, about gender and hierarchy in many, parts of Afghanistan um, mean that victims of uh, SCA are not able to speak about their abuses, you know. The social structures as well. Um, um, and this is an issue that, you know, we have our, our whole, of, whole of Afghanistan assessments that, that, that is actually conducted by REACH and so many other assessments in the country reflect on how um, community leaders, you know, are the decision makers, and and in in most cases they are often men. And and I want to just to share an experience on this because I was in South Sudan for a couple of months when I worked there, and I was in one of the camps, you know, and and it was a very big challenge to have um, women participate in 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 activities, not live about reporting PSEA, but then just forming that kind of a women. Um, leadership, you know, was was a very very big problem. But then we had to um, ensure that it's clearly communicated and that they know that there is need because women need to um, raise concerns affecting them, and uh, they probably have better solutions to address those problems. Because in most meetings, men who come to those meetings, I'm not saying men are just taking the lead, but you know, um, um, even complaining that women did not get this, women did not, but when you try to touch base with women, it's completely different from what we thought. And, and that, you know, they had solution in, in their hands and that we decided to form this kind of 50-50 leadership um, in some of the location. Maybe I'll speak about that a little bit later, just to continue. And then um, on, around the sensitiv sens sensitivity issues, um, the underreporting, you know, um, is also another challenge, and then sweeping um, the um, SCA under the carpet, you know, like it doesn't happen. It's, it's not happening, you know, that's our culture. It's not supposed to, you know. So hiding it and not talking about it, you know, just assuming it, it's just another big problem um, that need to be addressed. What are the ways to address these issues? Basically, um, what we're doing is we continue to build um, relationship with all the stakeholders in the country. Um, when I talk about the stakeholders, it's starting from top to bottom, you know, different organizations, different partners, different sectors, um, as well as um, the government officials at, at this high level. Um, getting commitment of senior management and uh, political leadership in the country. We, 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 we have regular updates um, on, on what's happening in the country around PSCA and that if support required, more than happy to, um, to support us. Um, use, the, use of um, uh, information education, communication materials and, and build capacity. So for us, this is very key. And I think this can also work. We haven't tried because we are currently um, in, the, in the process of finalizing our IEC materials trying to touch base with colleagues in other countries and see what, what would work best, but then trying to contextualize this IEC materials as well that can also be used um, widely by the different um, affected, um, affected people. Um, collective ownership and accountability of a PSCA task force action plan with PSCA coordinators and the technical, um, technical support. Uh, maintain diplomatic engagement, uh, building trust uh, res and respect, transparency and accountability is also um, something that we are working on. Of course, it's work on progress. And then um, utilizing um, the trusted um, community leaders in the country. Um, so the multiple um, two-way communication, just get it. yeah, sorry two-way communication channel for making complaints and getting responses that fit Afghanistan. Um, 
probably just to ask a question, you know, um, what's needed for an effective complaint reporting? Yeah. Community members say they are most comfortable talking to the local NGOs, you know, and, and community leaders, because at most times the local NGOs, the community leaders are the ones in, who interact mostly with the community. And so they feel more comfortable, you know, to raise their concerns and, and, and probably to address some of the issues affecting them. And then uh, many community members also say that they are comfortable calling because so a wise Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan, we have like a, um, a like a, a hotline, a free toll hotline for um, where people can call. When I say people, like when the community can call and launch their complaints, raise their concerns, you know, and, and as well as refer as much as them. So this is a very common, um, it's a central kind of um, um, hotline that is very well known by, I think, the whole of, the whole of Afghanistan. Um, some organizations have internal complaint response mechanisms. For example, the phone lines, um, designated people that are um, community can access, you know, and we say that the more community choices, the better. We cannot impose what doesn't work, right? Rather, we have to engage them, get to understand what would really work best for them and what they feel more comfortable um, using and accessible and respected, you know, um, within the society. Um, we also have some kind of clear um, helpline guideline protocols for sharing information um, in the complaint and response mechanism. I think this is very key for us because also staff get to know how they need to report these cases, um, what are the procedures, what are the do's and don'ts, you know, and, and the flow chart on how, how soon is one supposed to respond. So these are just a couple, um, few examples, three examples actually that I have, um, I have to share with you on what we have in Afghanistan. So I just follow my castle. So this is the AWARS um, um, hotline um, toll free. Um, these are the numbers, so which is very um, like very famous for every um, affected population in the country. And this is for WFP. So the number is for free. Apparently you can even call, you know, um, you don't have to pay, it's, it's free. So you just call and you speak to the person uh, that you can speak to. And these are very well trained staff. As I said, there are clear guidelines and policies on, on how to handle these cases. And staff are fully aware on how to report and refer accordingly, as well as provide feedback. And this is from UNICEF. So as I started by saying, we work as an interagency here. We, we don't work like as individual organizations, they, that kind of coordinated approach which makes um, 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 work a little bit more easier, not easy, but a little bit more easier. Um, the importance of high level government uh, PSEA focal point. So um, um, a UN and the government um, uh, of Afghanistan, you know, dialogue is essential to discuss um, the sexual exploitation um, and abuse allegation against government officials. Um, important also to understand which government office should identify the government um, focal point and then the relevant UN focal point for engaging with the government um, on this topic. So not speaking specifically um, about Afghanistan, but I think in, in other countries as well, you will notice that um, there, there are just cases that would be government alleged cases, you know, where do you refer these cases? How do you approach these cases? Do you just sweep them under the carpet? Have we tried to engage with the, with the, with the senior government officials or our leadership at the high level, the head city to see how best they can support um, um, further engagement, you know, to have someone that is going to be accountable and responsible um, for this kind of um, cases. So in our context, actually we've um, kind of engaged. I think we are at, at least I would say we are at some level with the support of the senior management, um, support of OCHO, support of HCT, you know, to, to probably, um, 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 you know, um, find a better way of approaching this. It can be a very sensitive issue, I must say, but again, sometimes we can't tell the government what they are supposed to do, right? But we can, um, bring our, 
but join our efforts together and, and find some kind of solution to tackle some of the problems, yeah? And, and with that, I think we've drafted a couple of letters, couple of talking points, and, and, uh, and it's, as we speak, it's, it's something that is being addressed at, um, at a senior management level. So the importance of training um, NGO staff on uh, uh, prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse practices um, and of engaging donors you know, helps um, organization design effective policies and implement actions, you know, such as dedicating um, uh, people and, um, and procedures for sexual exploitation and abuse, for preventing sexual exploitation and abuse, right? Um, uh, importance of uh, training NGO staff on this is to build staff skills for improving engagement with the local community. Another importance of engaging, uh, of training um, um, NGO staff is it informs staff on effective ways to raise beneficiaries awareness on PSEA. It also expands staff knowledge um, of community-based complaint mechanism. It promotes um, effective recruitment and monitoring of performance against um, terms of reference, right? Um, it also encourages prompt um, responses to people failing complaints through investigation procedures and, and referral um, to services. And, and not to forget that, you know, um, holding a training costs some money. So we, we really need to um, um, put this into consideration, even as we plan, we do our proposals, our project, um, engaging the community at the same time is important to know that we cannot hold the training if the training is not funded. We won't be able to hold some of the PSE related activities if these activities are not funded. So this is very important. On this side, um, it's just one of our task, PSE task force members from Concern Worldwide. We work very closely on, on PSE related matters in the country. And so this is just capacity building um, one of the initiatives in terms of the capacity building that is happening at the, at the grassroots level. Uh, the last one, but not the least, um, PSEA as a cross-scouting coordination issue in Afghanistan is that all agencies need to have a designated PSEA focal point and alternates to enhance collective PSEA responsibility. You can't do it alone. The task force can't do it alone, but important to identify someone within the organization or an alternate within the organization can who can basically support um, the PSEA implementation in the country. Um, uh, coordination requires having um, the right people um, from the different entities. You know, the focal point list should be updated every six months. Like for us in Afghanistan, that's what we do. We we make sure that we have the right people in our discussions, and we emphasize on this because we want to. Hold our meetings. We want to come up with very clear action points in our in our meetings, and we want to follow up and to understand, you know, how best we can engage further. And then, because of the number, because of the context, I think, and and probably difficulties and challenges, there is a quite a high number of staff turnover. So we we make sure that we touch base with the country directors of reps um, who are members of the PSEA task force in the country quite often to update them the list. Um, also for us in, in Afghanistan, PSEA is a topic of discussion in, in cluster meetings, in sector meetings, and other coordination bodies, you know, and, and um, PSEA is usually the first agenda item, you know, not the last. I, I must say that because in most cases, PSEA is considered to be the last, you know, when you're almost getting into the AOB, right? It's an all PSEA, can you give us your updates, you know? So you know what I mean. If, if you're a PSEA focal point, you definitely know what I mean. Um, the PSEA task force in Afghanistan collaborates with the AEP working group and the gender, um, um, the GIHA, the Gender and Humanitarian Action Working Group, the protection clusters and the subcluster. I think I mentioned this earlier, but I think it's important to emphasize the importance of that collaboration you know, in a country where we have cluster system, I think it's much easier to coordinate some of these activities and bringing everyone else um, on board. So I think that's the end of my session. Thank you so much. My contacts are indicated, as you can see. Over to you, Esther. 
Thank you. I was muted. Thank you very much, Janet. That was extremely interesting. I see there's a lot of questions on the chat and a lot of chat. So uh, you've, you've, you're all very active. I just want to take Uwe's question, which is directly for Janet to uh, and that's actually a really key <laughs> question. Have those efforts in Afghanistan brought about more feedback and more complaints? So have you seen any concrete changes or not yet? Uh, please pardon me. Uh, what's the question? Sorry, because I'm trying to read my... Yeah. yeah, the question was, have those efforts which you made in Afghanistan brought about more feedback, more complaints? Have you seen any concrete changes or is it too early? I think it's too early to say that, but um, we're still in the, you know, it's it's not an easy task, I might say. Like the, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but engaging one, two, three, you know, on the daily basis, we can. I would say we can see some some changes, especially at the country office level. You know, where we have um, we have a, a very extensive, you know, awareness raising, especially with the different um, international and national organizations on on PSCA. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Janet. I, I just want to take up some other comments just to maybe clarify. A lot of people have asked, is this just about SEA? Of course, complaints handling is not just about SEA. Um, this, this webinar builds up on, a, on another webinar we had earlier this year in May, where we went through some very basic concepts. What we wanted to address this time is really about how do we give out these messages? How do we reach out to communities? Because that's what we see is often the difficulty um, with organizations. And I can see with your questions also, that's where we usually are stuck. However, of course, the system needs to accommodate all complaints. So we usually distinguish between operational complaints and sensitive complaints. And sensitive complaints are everything around, of course, sexual misconduct, but also around just exploitation, which doesn't necessarily need to be sexual. Uh, this is also about harassment. This is also about how you accommodate complaints around discrimination, around bullying, a lot of different levels of sensitive complaints. What is finally the underlying of many of those um, sensitive complaints is really the issue of power, uh, feeling powerless or being empowered. To, to raise a complaint and we feel more empowered if we trust and if we trust the outcome. So if we have an incentive to actually submit our complaint to the organization because we know that the organization will address this. So that is for this uh, global um, question which came up a couple of times. Uh, a lot of, um, we will not have time to address all your questions but as usual we'll have a QA. and a um, a Q and A um, feedback uh, document where we will collect your questions and give some answer to your questions. I just want to take up another one which somebody has submit submitted, which was about if we have field officers going into the communities and receiving complaints, uh, would it be good practice that they receive complaints when we have a complaints focal point, point which we use to, you know, receive complaints. So again, I think go and ask the community, how would they feel confident? If the community feels confident to speak with the field officer rather than contact maybe the focal point, which is maybe in the capital city or not on the spot, then use your field officers to collect complaints. That is one channel. And then of course you need to train your field officers that they know what they should do with a complaint. Maybe they have the form with them so they can fill up, fill in the form, take the right information and ensure that they know that then this information needs to be channeled to your focal point and that they don't deal with the, with the issue locally or on the spot. So again, this is about having well-trained staff who know what they should do, who know what is their role in complaints handling, in receiving complaints, but also in raising awareness. If staff is knowledgeable about the rules, about what we mean by, by our different commitments, they, all of them should be champions in complaints handling, in telling people that yes, they can raise a complaint and that's the way they can raise it. This is the number they can call or this is the email they can use or this is the person that they can speak to. Yeah, um, Esther, if you allow me. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I think it's it's also very important to mention um, some best practices that probably we already know because um, we are in this. But I think making good use of the community forums is also very, very important. You know, when I talk about the community forums, could be like um, um, probably women group, you know, youth group, um, you know, um, community leaders, um, democratically, I would say, elected community leaders. And um, um, because when I talk about democratically elected community leaders, these are people that are fully, fully elected by the community and they are trusted within that particular society. And, you know, once we have this kind, because I know that it worked very well in some countries. Some countries due to safety security reasons might be very tricky, but you know, making good use of the community is very, very key. And, and these centers, you know, like women's center, protection centers, um, um, child-friendly spaces, these are also um, um, places that we explore, you know, to have the community come in there, um, 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 raise their concerns. Because sometimes when you even put suggest suggestion boxes, they're not gonna use the suggestion box probably because their understanding level on how to use it or culturally not appropriate. Um, um, you know, people feel shame to go, you know, complain and so on and so forth. But, you know, sometimes when you have a smaller group discussions, people tend to speak up when they trust you and, and you know, you're presentable and you listen to them and you give them feedback at the same time. I tell you for sure that some of them will speak out and it helps, it helps a lot. Yeah, just 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 a simple example. Over to you, Esther. Yeah, thanks, Annette. Again, this is about giving different possibilities. I think that that goes into one of the questions I'm just reading. Should we have only one unit handling CRM and PSA, or is it better to have different people, units working in close coordination? Usually how it works best is that you have a number of channels to receive your complaints. So that can be your stuff, that can be a box, that can be an email, that can be a number of, of, of uh, different ways which need to be appropriate and which need to be known and which communities should have participated by identifying. However, at the end, there needs to, the, the best how it works is if you have a, a sensitive complaint is that this is de dealt with not by just everybody, but it's dealt usually through a central um, unit so that um, you are sure that you have the right expertise also to lead the investigation and you have, um, you also have the knowledge uh, high up at the higher level of the organization to give them also feedback on complaints and give feedback on numbers. Uh, so that's how it usually works, but obviously it also depends on the size of organizations. I have one more question for you, Jeanette, because that's a question which came up a number of times and one was addressed to you. Okay. Quite a few people wondering, and I'm actually that's sometimes what I wonder myself, how, may, how can you make these systems um, accessible for people with uh, physical impairedness? So not just being in a, in a wheelchair, maybe that's, that's still possible to access, but how about people who are blind? How about people who are deaf? How can we um, how can we include them in that system? Um, yeah, I think um, as, as as I said, uh, um, it's it's not so easy, and 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 one of the best ways that we could approach that is basically um, you know formation of these um, community groups, you know. I know in some places there would be like um, um, the PSN's uh, group, the PSN's working group, you know, where all these people come together and and discuss um, and discuss um, issues affecting them. So we could make good use of um, of such forums, you know, and and um, let them know their rights, let them know that they have to report, and they also have a right to receive feedback at the same time. Uh, um, getting them to know um, specific um, service provision and that, count, that count, accountability aspect, uh, part of it, which, which is very important. So to my experience, I think not in Afghanistan, but in other countries that I've worked in, um, formation of these community, community groups really, really helped a lot, like engaging them on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis, you know, 
or considering them in every community um, or in any humanitarian kind of invent, event, inviting them to be part, part of it. But again, for the blind people and for the deaf people, to be honest, I don't have any concrete feedback on this. Maybe colleagues in my fellow panelists probably have better experiences than me that they can be able to share on this specific um, specific um, classification. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Janet. We'll share some some information on this subject in the in the Q and A document we're going to share with you. There is another question I think which is interesting uh, from Alexander about um, is it better to have a unified feedback mechanism used by all agencies, or should NGOs look at their uh, developing their own systems? There have been a number of um, of pilots in different countries to try to have a unified uh, a joint system, at least in, for example, refugee camps or in uh, ident very identified project. It is not it is not an easy process, I have to say. So uh, from the perspective of the um, of the survivor of the complainant, clearly a unified system is the easiest. So you don't need to know where to go. You have one one uh, common uh, system independent of who is who is the alleged um, who is the subject of your complaint but it, it needs a lot of coordination between the agencies a lot of agreements uh, there's different systems how you then take disciplinary action because that also depends on the country um, of the contract of the subject of the complaint so it is not easy but of course it would be a very valuable tool for to make it um, more accessible and easier to access for um, for the beneficiary and communities. I think we are, there's a lot of questions also on digitalized systems, on uh, somebody saying, yes, uh, I think it's good to involve religious people. Exactly, um, in some countries, um, religious sites are also good sites for um, raising awareness, distributing information. Um, collecting information, having people participate. So again, a lot of this needs to be contextualized in, in each country, and I would even say in each project, program or region. Um, there are some basic concepts which we want to follow about transparency, accessibility, confidentiality and security, but then we need to contextualize where we work and, and uh, really have a very active and meaningful participation from the communities and from other stakeholders. I'm conscious of time. So um, I think uh, Huram will still have some poll to end this session. Uh, meanwhile, I want to tell you that I've uh, been very happy to see a very active participation, lots of questions. We've not been able to take them all, but we'll reply uh, to them in this um, Q&A document. Thanks a lot for your participation and I'm, I wish you a really happy day wherever you are. Thank you very much, Esther, uh, for facilitating it all along so well and uh, for keeping everybody involved and uh, you know, I mean, responding back to all the comments of the key questions, picking up on the right ones. So thank you very much also for your very, very helpful presentation and Janet uh, for a very relevant uh, presentations earlier on. And it was very focused and relevant for I'm sure a lot of uh, participants for all of us, especially from the community perspective and coming from the field. So thank you very, very much. On uh, behalf of uh, CWS Asia and ICWA, ADRRN and OCHA, including all the valuable members and partners, I would like to thank everyone for your time and commitment to promote Q&A for the principled humanitarian actions. It's really a pleasure to see that the understanding around uh, quality and accountability initiatives and instruments is growing and there's a greater demand for accountability to affected population at all levels. We are gradually progressing towards the greater agenda of uh, humanitarian response. 
at the same time we also hope that you all are enjoying the learning and sharing uh, during the webinar series cwsa has been organizing under the 2020 regional humanitarian partnership event the valuable inputs and your contributions have made through this webinar and also during the future webinars will help us shape a policy paper actually that we are aiming to publish as a result of these regional consultations thank you very much again and we are very grateful to all those who have shared their questions in advance and also during uh, the discussion throughout the webinar before we really uh, close uh, the webinar please make a note of the the and uh, for, yeah firstly uh, do respond to the poll here uh, we really need your feedback and uh, value it a lot and also note the announcement um, the details displayed on the screen for our next upcoming webinar uh, it's a panel discussion uh, on December 14 about uh, is accountability truly embedded in organizations core values and activities so uh, we really hope that you all will register and participate and uh, also uh, remain engaged as we continue to be connected via this platform so thank you very much again and i think from here we'll say goodbye to everyone and have a very good day ahead